In this series of talks, we learn more about some of the artists included in the 2020 Craft Invitational. Running through October 11th, 2020, the exhibition includes over 70 works by a select group of regionally based craftspeople working in ceramic, glass, wood, paper, and metal. The exhibition highlights fine craft with an emphasis on traditional materials handled in unexpected and innovative ways. The artists in this exhibition are transforming basic, familiar materials into complex, insightful works of art. In the process, they are not only keeping traditional craft techniques alive, they are blazing new technical and creative paths for future craft artists. Hello, my name is Stacy Gage Peterson. I am the curator and registrar at the Dubuque Museum of Art. Welcome to this artist talk for the 2020 Craft Invitational. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Don Friedlich, a jewelry artist from Madison, Wisconsin, working in glass and metal. Six of his brooches are in the Craft Invitational. Hello, Don, thanks for joining me today. Hello, Stacy. happy to be here. Well, we're so excited to have your truly mesmerizing works in the exhibition, and I am just as excited to hear your short talk today. To begin, just a brief introduction for those less familiar with Don and his work. Don received his BFA in jewelry and metal smithing from Rhode Island School of Design and has since been a leading figure in contemporary American jewelry. His jewelry is in the permanent collections of many distinguished institutions, including the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the C C Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, the Corning Museum of Glass, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Don has been particularly innovative with material and process in his jewelry. He was the first jeweler to receive a residency at the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. He's lectured at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery in Washington, DC as part of their Distinguished Artist Series and taught workshops at Corning, Haystack, and Penland, among many others. He was selected for what is widely considered the preeminent annual jewelry exhibition in the world in Munich, Germany. In 2017, he received an award from the Society of North American Goldsmiths, of which he is a past president. In recognition of his extensive service to the organization and the field. In his talk today, titled Things That Make My Heart Beat Faster, Don will be speaking about his journey as a jewelry artist. A journey full of thoughtful discovery, never-ending curiosity, and as you will see, always a good sense of humor. With that, Don, when you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. The title of my talk, Things That Make My Heart Beat Faster, comes from part of my approach to making art. Approaches vary from artist to artist, but for me, I think of it as one of discernment, of finding the things that excite me visually, emotionally, and intellectually, and trying to understand why they excite me, the things that make my heart beat faster, and then try to bring those qualities into my jewelry. I grew up in what can now be called the soprano section in New Jersey, and as a child, I had no interest in art whatsoever. It wasn't until my early 20s when I met a jeweler skiing in Stowe, Vermont, and she started to teach me that I discovered working with my hands. This led me to classes at the University of Vermont and then eventually to Rhode Island School of Design where I got my BFA in 1982. The process of discovery it was basically finding a creative side that was completely dormant that I had no idea was there. It was kind of an exciting process of self-discovery. At RISD, I worked with a wide variety of materials. Uh, I worked with some great faculty, Robin Quigley, Klaus Burry from Germany, Lewis Muller and others. Um, I also worked with Yel Chihuly, who was uh, taught our professional practices class, which was really useful. Uh, I got interested in a book of photographs of traditional Japanese packaging called How to Wrap Five More Eggs. And I tried to bring some of the qualities of those wrappings into my jewelry. I also became fascinated with Japanese gardens. This 
slide is here to show the importance of quality photography, but it's also the last and I think the best piece I did as a student, working with ideas of balance and composition and tension. At this point, I got out of school. I set two primary goals. Number one, I wanted to make a living at my work. And number two, I wanted to continue the artistic development that I found so satisfying at school. To do the first, I applied to the three leading craft shows in the country. To do the second, I sent portfolios to the three leading galleries in the country. And I was very fortunate and I got into all three craft shows and I was taken on by all three galleries within the first year out of school. But before I could do any of that, I decided I needed to do something that I hadn't done in 13 years. I had to get a haircut. The first thing that happened was uh, I was in a new artist show at Artware Gallery in Soho in New York City. And the owner, Robert Lee Morris, looked at all my student work and picked out these two pieces and asked me to do a collection of earrings based on these two designs for his show. I only had a, one month to do all this. So it was one of the most manic periods of my life. The earrings I developed became the basis of my production line. I think both one of a kind work and multiples that are more affordable and often more wearable and accessible to people. Andy Goldsworthy said, it was very important when I discovered I could actually learn from making art instead of being a means of dumping my feelings or ideas that acted as a kind of vehicle for getting information. I traveled in the American Southwest and was just knocked out by the landscape, especially the effects of erosion on the natural environment. When I got back to my studio, I worked with a sandblaster with a slate, which had become my main material, to literally erode away the stone. And slate's got a beautiful range from rough and craggy to smooth and sensual. This was all an old chalkboard I'd found at one point and smashed up. I had an idea for a new material. This is a lamination of sterling and 18 karat gold. And after a long search in the jewelry industry, I found somebody to manufacture it for me. After the development, I turned it over to the field so other people could work for the same material. It's a lamination of sterling and 18 karat gold and it's 1 20th gold content by weight, which means I had the color quality and the richness of the gold, but closer to the price of the silver. I get interested in the interaction between jewelry and clothing. So the piece on the top uh, has got sort of a window in it. And the, my idea is that the fabric, the, the jewelry is worn on becomes part of the composition. In production work, design decisions become lifestyle choices. I've always done production and I look to my one-of-a-kind work to inspire my production line. So these were molded, these earrings and, and cufflinks were molded off of the slate that I was using for the one-of-a-kind work and then combined with the bimetal. They're designed to work with, aesthetically with my one-of-a-kind work, but they're also designed to be largely jobbed out so I can spend my time mostly on the one-of-a-kind work and have other people help with the production line. The texture also makes them very quick to finish. So it's an aesthetic decision, but it also has practical lifestyle implications. I wanted to bring color into my work. I did a little bit of work with glass and a fairly large body of work with semi-precious stone. This is a Brazilian agate at the bottom. Still working with a sandblaster as a primary tool. And I kind of taught myself lapidary work, stone cutting work, which I hadn't done before and bought some equipment, some diamond, water-cooled diamond abrasive equipment. I wanted to bring pattern into my work. After a while with the harder materials, I found I missed the slate. And after working with agates, which are seven on a hardness scale of 10, and slate is about a three, maybe a two, slate was just butter to work with. And I found out I had a whole new group of things I could do with the material. Graduation may be the end of your schooling, but it's just the beginning of your education. As an artist, one of the best parts of it is that it's a lifetime of learning. And I've been looking for a class to take at Haystack or Penland, the summer workshop programs, uh, with somebody from Europe, <clears throat> from Europe. 
And David Watkins, who was head of the Royal College of Art jewelry program in England, uh, was teaching a three-week class at Haystack. And it was just what I was looking for. David had us do something for a grove of trees in the kind of the space between these two saplings. I did kind of a Andy Goldsworthy knockoff um, idea. And I enjoyed the process, but I didn't think it would have that much effect on me. But when I got home, it immediately affected my jewelry. And I started carving these much more organic stick-like forms. The one with a little not four minute is in the permanent collection of the Victorian Albert Museum in London. My production line continued. This is a collaboration with a large German manufacturing company and um, they're black onyx inlaid with diamonds and a man-made ruby also inlaid with diamonds set in gold. In 2001, I kind of exhausted what I could do with glass with my limited skills. And I started going to the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass in upstate New York to build a second set of skills and expand what I could do. Going to the studio, it was like going from driving an old Chevy to somebody give me, giving me the keys to a Maserati. The equipment was so much better than what I was used to. Ideas that were taking me days, I was doing in 30 minutes and it was very freeing artistically. The piece on the right is a collaboration with a glass blower, and then the ones on the left, which are sort of textile related and sail related forms, uh, are cut out of uh, Pyrex tubing. In 2003, I was the first jeweler to be given an artist in residence at, at the studio. These are very prestigious spots and very coveted. It's an international competition. They give out five to seven of them a year, and it's a month of free access to the studio. My proposal was to work with a glass blower to develop new forms, and this work came out of that. So why glass? Simply stated, glass is the most flexible artistic material ever created. It can be as clear as water or as opaque as stone. It can be any form in the world. It can be thousands of colors. It can be reflective, transparent, translucent. It can be blown, it can be cast, it can be cold worked, it can be sandblasted and many other processes. So I wanted to make jewelry that heavily magnified the clothing that it was on. It was an attempt to bridge three craft media, to make jewelry made out of glass with textile imagery. To make these lens, these lens forms work, I thought, perhaps graphite molds would be the solution that I needed. And as you can see, I was able to work it out. It took me a while to figure out what I needed was spheres and cylinders to make this idea work. Here I'm working at the University of Wisconsin on a milling machine and carving a piece of graphite. Graphite's very soft and carves very easily. It's a bit of a mess. I kind of think of it as a pencil sharpener from hell. And here's some of the works that came out of that. The next step was computer-aided design. I was an artist in residence at Kendall School of Art in Michigan and I, for a week, and I spent half the time with the faculty playing with their very cool high-tech toys and half the time with the students doing lectures, critiques, and demos. This has expanded what I could do in terms of forms. The piece being machined here with CNC is not one of mine. It's something I took off of YouTube. And what I wanted to do was pieces inspired by water and living on the lakes in Madison, Wisconsin. And these are the forms that came out of it in the mold. These are done through a process called press molding, where hot glass at about 2,000 degrees is taken from a furnace and then put into a mold. That's me with the gloves and the paddle there. It's stripped into the mold, sort of like a 2,000 degree honey dipper, cut off by the glass blower. In this case, it's Richard Jones, and then pressed down hard with a steel paddle. So the glass conforms to the mold. It freezes up, solidifies rather quickly as it hits the mold. It's then taken out onto a wooden paddle and annealed for about half a day in the kiln. 
to slow, slowly cool. This piece is in the exhibition and it's a particular favorite of mine, working with that aqua series idea. I wanted to make jewelry inspired by food. There are a few things more important to me than food and humor, but I never thought I'd bring either of them into my jewelry. I developed these cast asparagus and celery as brooches. And one of each of these is in the exhibition as well. I love the idea of being able to wear a stuck of celery as a brooch. I also worked with apples and oranges and the orange form on the bottom, the blue one is also in the exhibition. This is how the pieces are done. I've taken a mold off of um, an apple and an orange in back and then made a rubber positive, then made a plaster mold from that and then cast glass into the, into the, into the mold in a kiln. This is my butterfly brooch. So all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the right one. This is Occam's razor, a scientific precept, but getting to simple is anything but simple. I've done a little bit of larger work in sculpture. This is about 25 inches across. This is my current work, the Lumina series. I've been looking to Mark Rothko's color field paintings, James Terrell's amazing landscape sculpture, and I'm working with a material I've hated for my entire career called dichroic glass. It's kind of a garish material. It was developed by NASA for the visors of the astronauts originally. But I use it through a frosted surface and that calms down its harshness. This material can be both transparent and reflective at the same time. And it's two different colors depending upon whether light's passing through it or reflecting off of it. I'm working with the idea that jewelry is seen in motion. These are three different views of the same brooch. The one on the bottom is in the exhibition as well. This gives you an idea of what happens as the pieces move. You can see all the color changes. And some of my most recent works. here working in a kiln to slump the glass. My wife and I love to travel and our favorite trip was to the, Galapagos, to the Galapagos Islands, a truly amazing place. We found out after being there that this turtle was actually the grandfather of Senator Mitch McConnell. You can totally see the family resemblance. We live in the University Arboretum in Madison, a beautiful forested area. My home on the bottom and my studio on the top. And this is inside the studio. I'll give you a little video tour. Half the studio is set up for goldsmithing. Uh, this is my jeweler's workbench, uh, or two workbenches actually. A rolling mill. Nice little drill press set up there. One of my favorite tools. And back there is a small kiln that I do all my hot work in. If I'm working with loan forms, I'm working in somebody else's studio like Corning or a studio in Madison. An area for gluing. Uh, a lot of this work is put together with ultraviolet cured adhesives. A central work table where I can lay work out and see things in progress. A great big old sand blaster and compressor. The thing with a tire around it is called a flat lap. This is a rotating disc of abrasive diamond, water-cooled diamond abrasive that can go from rough grinding to polished and other lapidary equipment, including a diamond saw in that back corner there. When working with glass, everything needs to be water cooled. Small German engraving lathe. My cute little dog, Josie. So my final image, uh, this piece is called Necklace for an Insecure Man. I did this piece for a fashion show when I was president of the Society of North American Goldsmiths. Well, I took the job really seriously. I didn't take the title seriously. 
So I thought I'd have a little fun. And my final thought, the world is shaped by the activists, those that take the time to be involved, to do the work. So whether you're in the arts or some other field, I hope you'll try to make the world a little bit better. Uh, it certainly needs it these days. Thank you for your time. Dan, thank you so much. That was, that was a lot of fun and it was great insight into your work. And I really love the studio tour. So thanks for all your preparation today on your talk. Don't miss your chance to see these great, wonderful, beautiful, glowing brooches that you saw in the presentation today. Don's work at the Duma Second Craft Invitational. It's through October 11th. And you can also see a virtual version of the exhibition on our website at dbqart.org.